Anya Taylor-Joy is the alternative it girl. Her star has risen rapidly, but her star power seems to come from how she's different from her contemporaries in look, in fashion, and in her career choices. The thing about jumping from project to project is that you gain skills for that particular project. In a world where it's easy to feel like you know almost anyone, Anya intrigues us because it feels like we don't know her. Where is home for you because you live you've lived everywhere? Yeah, I don't really have one. Her multicultural background makes her hard to pin down, and she's played a wide range of characters, adding to her sense of mystery. She began her career at the age of 16 when she was scouted as a model in London. Take my dog for a walk and I see this car, and this guy sticks his head out the window and goes, if you stop, you won't regret it. But unlike some of her other peers who we've seen grow up on screen, it feels like Anya started her career suddenly, already fully formed. This unknowability elevates her work on screen. It allows her to straddle the line between hero and villain, strong and vulnerable, glamorous and ordinary. She gets to play with identity, status, and genre across her body of work. You should see the places they play in the Soviet Union. Oh, I'm planning on it. You have to get past me first. I'm planning on that too. Here's our take on Anya Taylor-Joy and how she commands everyone's attention by keeping us guessing. Anya is a shapeshifter, and so many of her roles carry with them a sense of transformation. This is key to her appeal. We never know what we're going to get when she comes onto the screen. One of my nicknames is Wendy Tink because I kind of flip between. This is particularly true of her most famous role to date as chess prodigy Beth Harmon in The Queen's Gambit. X plus Y is a binomial. In the novel that the series is based on, the character is described as the ugliest white girl ever by her only friend, Jolene. As a successful model, Anya Taylor-Joy certainly wasn't the most obvious choice for Beth Harmon, but she herself has commented on her unusual features, saying she thinks she's too weird-looking to be a Hollywood star. And while we would disagree with that statement, it is true that she's a break from the standard blonde bombshell in Hollywood. Her large, wide-set eyes make her seem otherworldly, and she's been compared to everything from an alien to a porcelain doll. Both the show and the novel version of The Queen's Gambit follow Beth's progression from a scared, nervous orphan to a confident, glamorous chess superstar. As she comes to believe in her genius, she grows in stature and confidence, and this is reflected in the reactions of people who have watched her journey. What happened to that gawky kid who kicked my ass five years ago? <laughs> Apparently, she grew up. Although Anya was already starting to make a name for herself in the film world, her performance in the hit Netflix show was widely considered her breakout role, and she earned an Emmy nomination for it. It took her from a relative unknown into a member of Hollywood's freshman class of A-listers. So good I am. In Last Night in Soho, Anya's character is introduced as unquestionably beautiful, but it's a particular kind of beauty. Oh, you're a gorgeous creature. What's your name? Sandy. She's a woman out of time, appearing only in flashbacks seen through the eyes of the more timid and meek Eloise. We know Eloise is obsessed by the styles and fashions of the 60s, and so Sandy comes to embody that ideal. A future star in the making who we get to watch as she's discovered, drawing parallels to Anya in real life before we find out her real, not-so-glamorous fate. And again, there's a sense of mystery and transformation with the perspective flitting back and forth between Sandy and Eloise as the connection between them reveals itself. This theme of transformation makes it hard to pin down who Anya Taylor-Joy really is. It plays out in her fashion, too. Her red carpet looks, which range from contemporary designers to beautiful vintage pieces, always stand out. But taken together, it's hard to define her style as any one thing. Like many other beauty icons before her, from Marlene Dietrich and Claudia Cardinale to more recent examples like Zendaya and Bella Hadid, she leans into this ambiguity and embraces her multinational identities and experiences. You know, I was born in Miami, raised between Argentina and London, and my first language is Spanish, so legally, my ethnicity is Fashion Week. And because she's so adept at being a shapeshifter, we're always looking for something more beneath the surface. The Queen's Gambit may have brought her global stardom, but Anya first took to the screen as a scream queen, playing both vulnerable protagonists and more nightmarish villains in independent and low-budget horrors. Abby the Witch of the Wood. 
As Thomason in The Witch, all of the film's fear is filtered through her. It's in her younger brother's guilty glances at her when she's not looking, and the narrative ambiguity about what exactly happened to the family's baby in her care. We know there's some occult presence taking shape, but we don't know what shape it's going to take, and neither does she. The fear we feel is her fear, fear about what's happening to her family and what's happening to her. Black Phillip Sif, you are wicked. I told me too. Damn your Black Phillip. He said you put the devil in Caleb. That's why he's sick. The same is true in Morgan. She plays the titular character, a replicant-type science experiment who wrestles with her own sentience and again comes to fear herself. Morgan does not understand what she is and how she should be. And much like with Beth Harmon, Anya is able to lean into her weird-looking features. Without makeup or glamorous wardrobe, she uses her large, wide-set eyes to seem almost alien. Compared to the ordinary characters around her, she feels distinct, and it's hard to know whether or not we can trust her. Open the door and let me help you. I don't need your help. I'm starting to feel like myself. Anya's choices aren't the standard genre fare. She does something new with well-established tropes. Eileen Giselle argues that the final image of her in The Witch, floating naked in the forest with Satan's other captives, is a liberating subversion of the final girl trope, in which one female character, bruised, bloodied, and traumatized, lives to tell the tale of the horror she endured. What's that like to live deliciously? Her role as Casey in M. Night Shyamalan's Unbreakable trilogy is similar. While in Split, she is more a traditional final girl, in Glass, the character returns. She is not defined by her experience of victimization. She gets to try to reclaim her story for herself. What he did to me was... wrong. Just like what your mom did to you was wrong. Our beloved Scream Queen most recently received praise for her role in yet another Robert Eggers project. The director of The Witch put his faith in Anya once more for the action thriller The Northman, and she did not disappoint. Your strength breaks men's bones. I have the cunning to break their minds. This time, Anya tapped into her witchy magic as the scene-stealing sorceress Olga, where the actress suffered through some seriously intense shooting conditions to deliver a wily yet sympathetic heroine. Covered in mud, in the ocean, minus three degrees, not wearing any shoes, not wearing any clothes, really. In a genre defined by heroes and villains, Anya's horror roles often show real empathy for outcasts and monsters, characters that are rarely treated complexly in the genre. In doing so, she subtly shifts our perspective and helps push these stories forward. While Anya's horror movie roles let her explore a more explicit darkness, she's also found a home playing high society period drama characters, which are much more subtle but still bold. She often subverts our expectations of these characters, illuminating something darker about high society living. My place is to protect this house and all in it, including you. We stand or fall together. We're currently living through a boom in historical fiction content that twists or reimagines the past. Things like Bridgerton and the new Fleabag-inspired Persuasion. Even musicals like Six or And Juliet play with our expectations and modernize our assumptions about the past. So on the surface, Anya's Emma is remarkable for how down the line it feels in comparison. However, Anya's take on the character feels far more critical than the typical aspirational heroine. I shall be sure to say three dull things as soon as I open my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Mom, but there is the difficulty. When have you ever stopped at three? While the setting still feels luxurious and opulent, and the costuming is decadent and glamorous, Emma herself is spoiled and conceited. Anya's performance highlights how this privilege creates a sense of entitlement and self-absorption in the upper class. I have been unpardonably vain. In Peaky Blinders, she plays a similarly affluent heiress with nefarious, manipulative character traits. The coldness she brings to the role illustrates how high society life is a double-edged sword. For all the luxury, it's incredibly unfeeling and artificial. My husband may do as he's told, but uh, I don't. And this theme continues even when she takes on high society roles outside of the period piece genre. As Lily in Thoroughbreds, her character's extreme wealth and privilege manifests itself as a kind of nihilism. While the social strata she's in may be safe and secure, it's also devoid of love or nurture. In fact, her friend Amanda literally can't feel emotions. So you basically have to learn all the automatic like processes that get triggered when you cry and then sort of manually generate each one. 
feeds back to the brain and the tears just come naturally. And again, her performance eschews the glamour of wealth and instead presents the sometimes cold and unfeeling nature of high society life. These performances make Anya Taylor-Joy feel modern and incisive. Yes, her elegance makes her fit organically into these period pieces and embody these privileged characters, but the way she uses those performances to show how cruel that world can be feels like a far more modern take. The more we see of someone, the less interesting they tend to become. But that doesn't seem to have happened for Anya Taylor-Joy, and she's not going anywhere anytime soon. She's soon to star in a cinematic tentpole as Furiosa in the next Mad Max film, taking on a character that's already been iconically played by Charlize Theron. You can get in. Not without them. It's hard to pin down what she might do with that role, or indeed any role, but that's because even when a character seems straightforward, she looks at them in a new way, and maybe understands them in a way they haven't been understood before. That's The Take. Click here to watch a video we think you'll love, or here to check out a whole playlist of awesome content. Don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications.